Thank you all for stopping by today, and we have an exciting talk at Google. Uh, we have Phil Terry, the founder and CEO of Collaborative Game. Um, he runs the Councils, which is a collaborative network of senior digital leaders. Phil has written about collaboration and the power of asking for help in the Harvard Business Review, and recently published the book Customers Included, which he is here to, um, to talk to us about. Um, the book details his 15 years as CEO of Creative Good, a pioneering customer experience consultancy. And so he's helped hundreds of senior leaders um, help each other run better, more innovative, more um, customer-inclusive companies. And so he also sits on the board of Mind the Product, which is a global community of digital product leaders, um, startups like Stella Service, and, uni and universities like the Harvard Business School's Rock Center for Entrepreneurship and the USC Institute of in Innovation and Startup Garage. So with that, please join me in welcoming Phil to Google. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you for coming. Thank you, everyone, uh, on Google Hangouts and uh, watching later on YouTube. Um, it, you know, I was thinking today when I got here, I haven't been here actually since um, 2002. It's a little bit changed. <laughs> Marissa Meyer brought me in um, in the early days. We, she was a founding member of these councils that we run here at Collaborative Game, which as uh, uh, the, uh, as Bradley Horowitz, who's our host today, uh, said, it uh, brings together executives from around the world who care about the customer experience and who want to really uh, ask each other for help. I'm a big fan of asking for help. Uh, so we're going to talk about my book, Customers Included. I want to walk through some of the stories from the book. Uh, the, I think the most important question that we ask in the book is, is really a simple one, right, and somewhat obvious which is um, we are not the first people to say the customer is important, <laughs> right? I mean, I think we can all agree this is not a revolutionary new insight. <laughs> wow. In fact, I trace the history of customer experience and the recognition that customers need to be the focus of businesses back to 1954, when Peter Drucker wrote his first book, Practice of Management. And uh, so it's a long time, and many other people uh, including uh, some of the key leaders, of course, here at Google, and many of you here in the audience, believe the customer is important. So you know, we all we all can agree on that. But I think we can also agree that um, we need to sort of look closely at if we agree that everyone knows this is important, more or less. Why is it that most companies don't actually do it, right? So as as customers and as executives, we know that in most cases, most products and services are, frankly, not that good, right? Uh, they go from bad <laughs> to OK. And there's only a few incredibly delightful things that are out there. So why don't more companies do it? And one of the, one of the, the, the talk will really try to address that. But one of the things I want you to keep in mind is that knowing it's important is clearly not enough. We have to think about habits. We have to think about actions. And we have to think about what are some of the barriers and obstacles. Now, I've been on this book tour. I've done about 90 talks in the last year. Um, I'll be at Apple tomorrow. I'm sort of doing the Silicon Valley swing this week, which is a lot of fun. Um, and uh, and it's, it's, it's really been great to be out at so many companies talking about these stories. But it's, um, it's also been great to be interacting with people along the way, including flight attendants and taxi drivers. And in the last couple of weeks, I've had a, some conversations that have had a big impact on me that I want to actually share with you before we jump into some of the stories. OK, this is one of my taxi drivers in Boston. OK, so I was there a couple of weeks ago. And it was during the big storm, right? It was 25 inches of snow, the travel ban. Then the next day, I got in a cab. And I asked this gentleman how long he'd been driving, you know? And he said, oh, about a year. I said, oh, that's, that's great. What would you do before? He said, well, I own several car dealerships. I said, really? Wow. How would you go from car dealerships to taxi driver? I mean, those are usually profitable businesses. And he said, well, I had a, I, and then he told me a personal story. He had a heart attack. And he was in a coma for three months. I like, oh, wow. OK, so that sort of I had to think about that for a minute. We talked a little bit about what that experience was like, you can imagine. And then I said, why does that mean you lost your businesses? So I'm sure your employees and even customers probably rallied around you. And he said, well, actually, no. 
I uh, had been a greedy and arrogant owner. I had mistreated my employees and I had mistreated my customers. And when I got sick, they all fled. And by the time I got out of the hospital, my car dealerships were bankrupt. I go, oh, wow, really? And this is when he, when he picked me up, he was one of the most gracious, humble people I had met as a taxi driver, right? And then he went on to say how grateful he is for having had this experience. I said, really? Wow. He said, well, I'm closer to my family. My wife, thank God, didn't leave me during all those years that I was kind of a jerk. And she hung in there with me when I was sick. I'm closer to my children and now my grandchildren. And I'm filled with gratitude. And I, I mean, I, uh, so I posted this up on some social media sites. And the response was enormous, as you can imagine. And I just feel so touched by him. I feel like I'm here representing his story. And among other things, we have to remember that customers are real people. Employees are real people. You know, when we kind of move away from the frameworks and the guiding philosophy and the principles, it comes down to real live human beings, right? Like us. And it's so important for us to remember that and to remember that when we treat our customers well and we treat our employees well, they'll give us the benefit of the doubt. They'll hang in there with us when times are tough, when the economy is bad or when we're in the hospital like this guy. But if we take advantage of them, if we don't really listen to and have empathy for them, well, we won't have that margin of safety, will we, when times get tough? All right, so I just wanted to share that with you. It's really had an impact on me. These two housekeepers, during the Boston uh, storm and the travel ban was on, no one could leave their homes. I was in, uh, stuck in my hotel room, and I figured they're not going to clean the room. To, I can handle that, right? I mean, and at 1 o'clock, these two women knock on my door. I said, what? What are you doing? They said, we're here to clean your room. I said, but how did you get here? They said, we walked 30 minutes through the blizzard to get here. Now, there's two things about that. One is I thanked them, and I said, that's incredible. And I, each gave, I gave them each a very nice tip. And I said, wow, thank you, thank you. And then, of course, I thought, I'm not happy, actually, with the hotel. The hotel should have paid them to stay home, not to risk you know, life and limb to come and clean our rooms. We're customers. We care about how companies treat their employees as much as we also care about our own experience. But I think about them, and I, I sort of think, I'm representing them here today, right? And I bet they're Google users, by the way, right? OK. All right, so let's, uh, let's shift gears and uh, move into some of the stories. Um, and then a couple weeks ago, I was at the pre-IPO roadshow for Shake Shack. Anybody here Shake Shack fans? Yeah, awesome. That's Randy Grudy, the CEO of Shake Shack. And when the analysts at this kind of, it was in Wall Street in New York, right? So these are hard-bitten, cynical, skeptical analysts, right? Talking about the numbers and, well, what about In-N-Out Burger and blah, blah, blah. And Randy says, you know, you might think we're in the hamburger business. And, and we are, of course. We make hamburgers, and, and we make great custards and, and shakes, right? Some of you have had those. But he said, actually, the business that we're in is supporting the development of the leadership of our employees and creating an experience for our customers. Yes, certainly we make good hamburgers, but it's bigger than that. And they went on to talk in a non-cynical and really loving, you know, genuine, authentic, empathetic way about their team and about their customers. And I was watching this analyst group in Wall Street who were like, what? What are you talking about? What's about? There's number here. You know, I was like, they did not compute, right? But um, they understand that it's not just about the burgers. It's about the overall experience and the way they treat each other and the way they treat their customers at a human level, right? Real, living, breathing human people. OK. So uh, if you can hand me a copy of the book, thank you. Um, so the book came out in, um, in October of 2013, so just about a year ago, a little over a year ago. And um, we walked through a number of stories. First, of course, reminding readers that despite the fact that everyone knows we should include the customer, it actually doesn't happen very often. And then trying to answer the question, why? 
right? So let's just do a couple reminders. Um, so the first case study in the book is about uh, a government project that was politically contentious. And um, when it launched, it failed. So here it is, the, uh, the 2006 Border Patrol project. Okay. So Congress, in its infinite wisdom, first of all, took 10 years to build a 2,000-mile fence along the border with Mexico. Do we have any engineers here today? Yes? Right. OK, so if I told you, let's build a 2,000-mile fence, your engineering mentality would tell me what? <laughs> what? <laughs> if you can build it, how do you maintain it? So uh, then they said, OK, this isn't working. And then Boeing raised their hand and said, oh, hire us. Hire us. We'll build an electronic fence. You know, we'll use that technology stuff, you know, that cool internet stuff and, you know, digital stuff. And it'll be great. And so they built it, and of course, uh, it failed. All right. They, um, they fired the administrator from the Homeland Security Department who was in charge of the project, and they brought a new one on. And the poor guy's first job uh, was to um, go out on PBS and explain what had just happened. Okay. So the interviewer on PBS says, oh, uh, w wait a minute. You mean to tell me that you uh, built this whole thing for the Border Patrol? So Croft says, y you built a, a multi-billion dollar project for the Border Patrol? And wait a minute, you, know, but you didn't ask the Border, you didn't spend any time with the Border Patrol to figure out what they might need or want? That seems like a mistake. And he's like, oh, yeah, that was a huge mistake. So. Literally, uh, many, many companies and organizations literally don't spend a moment with their customer, even today, even though we all know we should, right? Dramatically unbelievable. Border Patrol. Let's move to Africa. So there uh, was an innovator who wanted to do something about the water access crisis in sub-Saharan Africa, right? This is an important issue, right? So in many parts of rural and semi-rural sub-Saharan Africa, Women and girls, and it's almost always women and girls, will walk a mile or two a day to fetch water for cooking, cleaning, and drinking, right? So I think we can all agree this is problematic on a number of dimensions, right? So this innovator said, let's do something about it. Let's build a play pump, okay? So we'll create a merry-go-round. This is a good idea, it sounds like, anyway. Merry-go-round so the, that the kids will play on, right? And this is helpful because we don't have electricity in many of these areas. So we'll use the action right, of the merry-go-round essentially to be a pump that'll pump water from further away and up into this water tower. Okay, Around the water tower, we'll put ads. All right? The ads will help us pay for the system. And then uh, you know, we'll just put a spigot nearby, and we'll use gravity to bring the water back down. Okay? So you know, I, it sounds good. So he goes to the Bush administration. And they say, great, and they write a check. He goes to the Clinton Global Initiative. And they say, great, we'll write a check. Right? So can you imagine your next product here at Google? You get Clinton, you get Bush, and then Jay-Z. Jay-Z says, great, I'll throw a, a lunch party for you at Madison Square Garden. Right? Fantastic. Then venture capitalists like Steve Case pile on the whole thing. Right? So you kind of get the idea of probably where I'm going here. So what happened? They went out, they installed this in some of these communities in sub-Saharan Africa, and it turns out that it took water out of these communities, didn't bring water in. What? And the Swiss Resource Center did an analysis of what happened. What happened? They said, oh, uh, they literally spent no time in these communities to understand how these people lived or what might work or not, right? So first of all, uh, how many of you grew up uh, playing on a merry-go-round? Let me just get it. Oh, almost everyone, right? Um, so that was a part of our culture, right? But it was not a part of the culture in many of these communities. So for example, when the donors and their camera crews left, the kids, uh, they stopped playing on the merry-go-round. They complained it made them dizzy. <laughs> like, well, that's the point, right? You want to get dizzy. But that wasn't their thing, OK? So the pumping action is gone, right? Now, advertisers, do you think they showed up? You know a little bit about ad sales, right? <laughs> that was as hard to figure out as the 2,000 mile fence, right? OK. So advertisers didn't show up. When it was working, it was five times slower than the old AfroDev hand pump that was designed in 1934 with a lot of community consultation, right? 
And worst of all, uh, when they installed, they installed it over the only existing borehole that these villages had. So when it broke down, they literally had no water. Okay? Oh my gosh. Right? Now, interestingly, what did Steve Case say about this? Did he say, uh, you know, wow, we, we forgot to include the customer. We all know what the issue is here. You know, no, he said something quite different, and it's worth reflecting on this for a moment. He said the following thing. He said, you know, it's just the very nature of innovation. You try some things, some things work, some things don't. You know, you throw it up against the wall, right? Now, I'm here to tell you, and I think you believe this already, it's not the very nature of innovation. This is one way to do it. And let's just be clear for a moment about the math that venture capitalists use, right? And it's a different math than we should be using in our own companies and when we're designing things like play pumps for water access in sub-Saharan Africa. So when you're a venture capitalist, right, the way it works is you make a bunch of investments and you only need one of them to go well, right? And that typically makes enough money for you and your limited partners. So it turns out if you make 10 investments as a venture capitalist and you want one of them to work, you only need each investment to have about a 40% chance or probability of success before your investment. So you basically say, oh, look, that's got a 40% chance of success. OK, I'll invest there. 40% there, there. You do that 10 times, you're almost guaranteed one of them will work. You don't know which, but one of them will work. Now, can you imagine here going to your boss and saying, OK, uh, let's spend several million dollars for this new you know, marketing initiative or this new uh, product here at Google, and it's got a 40% chance of success. <laughs> no, we need to use a different kind of math, right? And there's never a 100% chance of success in anything that we do, of course, including not doing anything. There's always risk with that. Um, but um, these unforced errors, where we're simply leaving the customer out of the equation completely, let, let, let's do away with those. OK, can we, can we agree? OK. Now, let's switch to the US and talk about an internet case study. So there's a company that, um, when it started, it revolutionized a whole category of the customer experience. And they had a heartfelt, emotional connection with their customers. They were passionate about what they were doing, and their customers loved them. Okay, And then a few years later, they went public, and their investors loved them. Right? Wow, the numbers are good. Everyone's happy, right? And then in 2011, they did a couple of things that almost destroyed the business. All right, so what happened? First, they said, oh, you customers love us. Well, great, we love you. We're all happy here. Um, we're not changing anything or adding additional benefits to the product, but we are raising the price by 60%, so uh, thank you very much. So yes, you can imagine what happened, right? So it's 2011, social media has become mainstream. So we were all using it. but. By 2011, so were our parents or brothers and sisters, that kind of thing, right? And there's a huge backlash, right? And then the, the, the CEO does a, a sort of a faux apology, which inflames passions even more, right? So now I have a little bit of personal advice for all of us, by the way, um, in our relationships, you know, the people we care about, <laughs> spouses, uh, friends, whatever. If we've offended them, um, don't do a faux apology. And, and, and you can usually tell by the word if. If you start with the word if, well, you're in trouble, right? If I've offended you, I'm sorry. Right? How do you feel about that? Not great. Doesn't work, does it? <laughs> <laughs> OK, so people got even angrier, right? And then about a month later, they announced that uh, we know we love that you know, this price increase and, <laughs> and the heartfelt apology for how we communicated it. Uh, well, we have further good news. We're splitting the company into two. And now you need uh, two accounts to do what you did before. And, and then it just all hell broke loose, right? So you probably now know who I'm talking about. Do you remember Jason Alexander from Seinfeld fame? He did the uh, Netflix relief fund at the time <laughs> on the Funny or Die website. OK, so um, interestingly, what did the tech press say about this? Did they say, Netflix, wow. You had that emotional connection. You created that great experience. You had that loyalty. And, and, and you've blown it. What are you doing, right? And do you remember they lost 800,000 subscribers, close to 
by the way, of their membership, which they'd never had anything like that before, that magnitude of problem. And their uh, stock price had been in the 300s and dropped to $50. Do you remember this? And uh, a friend of mine runs a hedge fund in New York, shorted it, wrote it all the way down. Uh, and then interestingly, by the way, he went long. <laughs> if I had followed him in that, I, I wouldn't be here today. I, I'd have <laughs> flown you down to my island in the Caribbean. <laughs> so, um, so what did the tech press say? Did they, did they say, Reed Hastings, you blew it? No, no. Uh, at least some of the tech press said the following thing. They said, you're just, your customers are dumb. They don't get it. You're being disruptive, right? Now, Netflix had truly been disruptive, right? And uh, I, I'm a big fan of disruption. But it often gets misused, the term, and gets pasted over things that don't work, right? And oh, well, it's disruptive, of course. Well, then, of course, we're supposed to support it, right? Um, and uh, I was talking at a uh, CEO summit last week, uh, a venture capital summit um, here in San Francisco. And, I, and disruption was you know, the word of the day, as you can imagine. And I said, look, I like disruption, but only when it's based on real customer insights, where we're solving an unmet need, where we're you know, creating a solution to a real pain point, not for its own sake. And it's taken on a bit of a life of its own. And this is in part due to a professor of mine at the Harvard Business School who in 1997 put out a book, OK? And the book knew, so you guys remember what 1997 was like. I'm thinking maybe some of you anyway. And um, it was uh, the early years of the first dot-com boom, right? Yahoo and Netscape had gone public in the previous two years. Google wasn't even alive yet. Wow. And, uh, but all the entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, they had gold dollar signs in their eyes, right? They couldn't wait to build and flip the next company. And the customer was really, frankly, let's be honest, not in that equation. Okay? And then my professor put out a book that basically said, not only is it not a problem that you are ignoring your customers, it would be a problem if you listened to them. And you could hear the cheers going up in Silicon Valley. Yes, wow. Not only do we not have to feel bad about ignoring our customers, we actually can feel good about it. It's intellectual justification right, for doing what we're already doing. And the book, of course, which you've heard of, if not read, is The Innovator's Dilemma. Um, now, there's a lot to like in this book, uh, and especially a lot to like in his later work. Um, but the thesis in the book essentially is if you listen to your customers, they'll tell you to do the wrong thing. And they'll make you vulnerable to some upstart that comes along and disrupts you, right? Um, and interestingly, he amends his thesis later, in his later work. He says, actually, what I meant to say is if you focus on their unmet needs, then you can be disruptive. Um, but you can't really ask them what they want, right? And of course, and that, I've believed that for 20 years, right? That, look, we have a problem in the, in the world of customer experience. Let's be honest, right? If we think it's important to include the customer in product development, which I do, and mentioned I've just joined the board of Mind the Product, by the way. It's a great community of, of product leaders from around the world and bringing their first event to the US. They started in Europe, actually, uh, in San Francisco in, uh, this June, if you're interested. But if you believe it's important to include the customer when developing and designing new products and services, then we have a problem, right? which is we simply can't ask what do you want? Because people often don't know. Not just customers. We all have this problem as human beings. We often don't know what we want, or we can't. We have a sense of it, but we can't verbalize it very well. right? So, um, so we have to find another way to get at these unmet needs. right? And we have to find a way to sort of break through uh, the blindness that companies have about their customers. That's the focus of the end of my talk. But before we get there, let me finish the, the Netflix case study. So <clears throat> what, did, what did Reed Hastings do here? Did he say, yes, you're right. I'm, I'm being disruptive. The customers are stupid. D damn the torpedoes. No, uh, no, actually, he did something quite different and quite rare for a CEO and, frankly, a leader here in Silicon Valley, and something that I think has uh, earned my respect and, and should yours. He said the following thing. This was arrogance based on past success. Wow. That's quite, that's quite a, an admission, you know? 
And look, in the course of human affairs, if we're successful, we become arrogant. And a little bit of arrogance is not a problem. I would argue, I hope not, because I am. <laughs> I needed to get up in the morning, put a little spring in my step, and I'm guessing you do as well. It's just when we get extreme arrogance. Well, remember those plays we read in high school? Those old Greek plays? What was the word the Greeks had for this? Hubris. Hubris. That's what we have to watch out for. And that's what happened here. Reed Hastings and the team at Netflix got some hubris, right? And it blinded them to the reality, the ordinary unmet needs of their customers, OK? So in addition to disruption, we get excited about the word innovation, right? And innovation is important, absolutely. Obviously, Silicon Valley is founded on the notion of innovation. Yet, sometimes it becomes about something more than innovating around the simple unmet needs of our customers. And in fact, what Reed Hastings said, not only this, that he was arrogant, but he realized they had been chasing the shiny object of innovation and had lost track of the ordinary unmet needs of their customers. He had lost track of the housekeepers we talked about earlier, or that taxi driver, you know, or our sisters and brothers, or for that matter, for all of us in this room. We are real living, breathing human beings. And very often, the things that we care about are not the super exciting, sexy, glamorous stuff that's bandied about in the press. It's being able to actually do the things we want to get done. Companies frustrate us on the most basic fundamental level, right? Prices are too high, or it's just too difficult to get something done. And of course, you know this at Google, because you changed everything here. You know, you, you remember the history. It, Yahoo built Google, right? So in the early days when Google came out, uh, the founders went around to these different companies and first tried to sell the search engine. And no one wanted to buy it, because Yahoo, Excite, Alta Vista, Lycos, they all believed this is, we're portals. We don't want to help people leave our website. We want to stick them to our website. In fact, that's the word they use. And as a customer, I've never wanted to be stuck to anyone. Thank you very much. And of course, what was the single most important and basic thing that users of the internet wanted to do in 1999, and by the way, still today? Search and find something. And search sucked, frankly, on those sites. So Yahoo said, yeah, OK, why don't you, you'll, we'll, you'll be our search engine. And so when you searched on Yahoo and you got search results, it actually said, powered by Google. And you, Yahoo built the Google brand because Yahoo had misplaced its focus on the customer and instead was focused on its competitors and on this inside the beltway kind of attitude. Right? Well, the same thing happened here at Netflix. They lost sight of the basic unmet needs of their customers. And so what Reed Hastings and the team did is said, let's get back to the basics. Forget about the shiny object. And they relentlessly, relentlessly, relentlessly innovated around how to, what's your, what's your name? Emily. Emily. How do we make sure that when Emily, and I'm making this up now, when Emily puts her kids to bed on a Friday night, I don't know if you have children, <laughs> and, uh, and she has an hour to watch something on television, she better not spend that whole hour frustratingly searching around Netflix to try to find something good to watch. Right? And they ended up doing a project that had actually started earlier in 2006, but they put more emphasis on it. Uh, and, and that is uh, this uh, creating subgenres to help you find things. Right? And so um, they actually, the head of product development at Netflix, put together a, do you know this story? They put together this big manual. And they hired a bunch of people to basically watch TV shows and movies and to uh, tag those TV shows and movies along a number of dimensions. Right? Is this based past, present, or future? Is it a happy, sad, or in the middle kind of ending? Is it an action film that has some interest to women because it you know, has an unusual female protagonist? Whatever the case may be. And what's so interesting is that Hollywood had never done this. Hollywood and the American film industry had been in business for 100 years, and they didn't know anything about their own content. Isn't that crazy? They knew you know, romantic comedy, drama, sci-fi, fantasy, action. But holy mo that doesn't tell you anything, does it? So um, Netflix ended up creating what they called alt-genres. I, I refer to them as sub-genres, whatever the case may be. And you've seen these, because you watch Netflix. And now you're going to see a little bit about my wife and I. Because these are the, uh, 
the subgenres that Netflix thinks we think you know would be interesting. Uh, and when the slide comes up, you'll see that it says things like uh, 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 quirky crime television dramas or, or dramas that dog lovers home alone on a Friday night might like. Right? <laughs> and, I, and I only a little bit joke about that last one. Let, let me ask you a question. Each customer is, is shown two or three or four or five of these subgenres or all genres in their, in their language. Um, but how many in total do you think Netflix created? Hundreds? Emily's going for hundreds. 2,000? You're going to just go for it. OK. <laughs> Anyone else? 76,897. Whoa. Crazy, right? Now, again, they didn't show each customer 76,000 subgenres. That would have been terrible, right? Um, now, if you watch Netflix, you also know that this, uh, this actually didn't completely solve the problem. Right, because you uh, it, these were kind of fun, and once in a while it would surface something that was interesting, but often it didn't. It's like stuff you'd maybe seen already, or really wasn't that interesting to you, right? But they kept hammering away on this question, and you know they did this whole crowdsourced development of their algorithm, new algorithm, trying to, and that was a very interesting project. Don't have time to talk about it now. They did this, and then they, but they kept asking that question: How do we make sure Emily has something to watch quickly and easily that she likes, right? And then what happened? Well, they sort of realized, holy moly, there's not enough good content. No matter what our navigation or classification scheme or uh, algorithm, Cinematch for recommending TV shows and movies, no matter how good those things are, there's a fundamental problem, which is there isn't the content behind it to bring to Emily. And then they did what? They made their own. They made their own. They made their own. And so when the crisis happened in uh, 2011, they had about 20 million or so Subscribers, they lost close to a million. Biggest, you know, negative, biggest loss in their history on a percentage basis for sure. And uh, but they started to get back to the basics, right? They realized they had been arrogant. They were ch chasing the shiny object instead of the basic needs of their customers. And then they created the alt genres. And then they, you know, decided to get into original content. So three and a half years later, only three and a half years later, how many subscribers do they have today? Do you know? They just came out with their numbers. Yeah, 54.5 in the last quarter. Yeah, wow. That's quite a change, right? Now, uh, if we're here in Silicon Valley, right, and we're talking about product development, we're talking about customers, we're talking about great design, uh, there's always one name that comes up, right? Well, you're saying about customers, but what about Steve Jobs? Thank you. So the third chapter of the book is called The Misunderstood Mr. Jobs. Right. So the myth of Steve Jobs is that he was a lone genius who knew exactly what Emily wanted before she herself knew without talking to her or anything and delivered it right when she was ready for it and boom, hit the ball out of the park. Right. Well, uh, the myth is partly true. Well, certainly they hit the ball out of the park with the iPhone. You guys did a good job with Android, too. Um, the, the numbers they had last quarter in the iPhone, unbelievable. Right. The problem they have today is what's next? But we're not, we're not going to address that right now. Um, the myth that is uh, not true is that he was alone. Obviously, a few people work at Apple. But even more importantly, and not well known, is that he got out from behind his desk and spent time with customers. Okay? Now, he did not like market research. We all know this, surveys, focus groups. I hope we all know, forget those you know, methodologies when we're developing new products. That's a waste of time. We can't ask people what they want. But he did know he himself had to get out and watch as people use technology. Right? Now, to substantiate this claim, we had a bit of a conundrum. Like, we, we have some conviction and direct experience that we can't uh, relate in the book. So what do we do? And we couldn't find anything <laughs> on the internet or in the public sphere until we found finally an article in the New York Times, at the end of which a San Jose State professor said, oh, yeah, Steve Jobs got out and observed customers. Ah, finally, a public thing we can point to. It's true, it just wasn't part of the myth-making machine. Now, what I do want to do is I want to show you a video from 1997 of Steve Jobs. Now, he doesn't say he observed customers, but you see his passion for the customer experience, and it's one of the clearest statements that he made in his whole career. Okay. Now, 1997, do you remember what was going on at Apple? Anybody? Almost out of cash, right? 
So Jobs had been fired in 85, left the board in 86, kind of wandered around the wilderness for a while, started a company called Next. Turned out not to be Next. <laughs> he did, though, you know, buy this little digital animation thing, right? What, what was that? Pixar. Ah, Pixar. <laughs> Pixar, fabulous, right? That was good. But by 1997, uh, he was back on the board at, uh, at Apple, and essentially the board said, well, you know, we're going down anyway. You might as well, <laughs> you might as well take over. <laughs> like, what a great mandate. <laughs> and uh, the first thing he does is he shuts down a bunch of stuff, right? And, and, and by the way, that pisses off a lot of external developers who had been working on things like OpenDoc. Some of you may remember OpenDoc, which he shut down. And all of a sudden, the products they were working on that had been built to work with OpenDoc you know, were orphaned, right? The video is kind of a grainy, unauthorized video from the uh, Worldwide Developer Conference in 1997 for Apple. Has anyone been to the WWDC for Apple, by the way? Um, you know, not necessarily. You have, right, exactly. Um, uh, and um, so, but you have a sense of it, right? What, what, what's it like? What's your impression? Light, sound, heart, you know, everyone's excited, you know, blah, 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 right? Cult. Well, that's not what it was like in 1997. It was the last 200 people who are hoping it doesn't die, but they're demoralized and they're pissed off. And when Steve Jobs says, you've got to start with the customer experience, you'll see in the audience people are like, right? And, blah, 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 blah. They pan to the audience. Blah, blah, blah. And, then, and then you hear, then you hear one person. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the cult that we, we knew later. This, this is the, the lowest point in the company, right? But... It's that moment when he chooses to make what I think is the clearest statement about his vision for how you think about customers and, and technology. So let's, let's see if we can watch this video. Opened up. And when you're finished with that, perhaps you could tell us what you personally have been doing for the last seven years. One of the hardest things when you're trying to affect change is that people like this gentleman are right in some areas. I'm sure that there are some things OpenDoc does, probably even more that I'm not familiar with, that nothing else out there does. And I'm sure that you can make some demos, maybe a small commercial app that demonstrates those things. The hardest thing is, what, how does that fit in to a cohesive, larger vision? And one of the things I've always found is that you've got to start with the customer experience and work backwards to the technology. You can't start with the technology and try to figure out where you're going to try to sell it. And I've made this mistake probably more than anybody else in this room. And I've got the scar tissue to prove it. And I know that it's the case. And as we have tried to come up with a strategy and a vision for Apple. Um, it started with what incredible benefits can we give to the customer? Where can we take the customer? Not, not starting with, let's sit down with the engineers and, and figure out what awesome technology we have and then how are we going to market that. Um, and I think that's the right path to take. So I think we all agree, you know, yes, start with the customer experience, not with the technology. And what are the amazing benefits, right? Um, and now, now we get to the conclusion of my talk and the most important thing that I learned in 15 years. All right, so much of the book, we go through stories. I've shared some of those with you today. They're fairly straightforward. You know, there wasn't anything necessarily revolutionary or different about it. I learned a lot from others. Others learned from me over the 15 years that I led this customer experience consultancy. Um, but there's one thing I learned that was unfortunately both the most powerful thing and the least practiced. Good? OK. OK. And that's where I want to conclude with, because um, I, I, want, I want to see if this will help you think in a new way. So. If we agree that we want to start with the amazing benefits, the problem that we, of course, have is how do you figure those out? Especially if you can't go ask somebody, 
what amazing benefits do you want, Emily? And you're like, well, I'd rah, rah, rah. you know, who I'd rah, rah. You know, and we'll say something, we'll give an answer, but it doesn't necessarily equate to what is, in fact, really important to us. Not because we don't want to be honest, but because we as human beings uh, often don't know. So what do we do? Well, w what we learned and what I learned is, uh, one, uh, get out from behind your desk and observe customers. So, yes, d is data important? I love data. I love data. I love big data. I love small data. I love medium data. <laughs> I love data of all sizes and kinds. Data tells you what, but it often doesn't tell you why, right? And you need some observations of real living human beings, like the housekeepers that we were talking about earlier, or the taxi driver, or your mother, or whatever, right? People that we're designing this product for. We need a few of real life human beings. And we need it for two reasons. One, because it gives us more of the why and fills out what we are looking at in the data. But we need it for a second reason, OK? And this, this is not well understood. When we work inside companies, right? Within about six months of working for a company, we start to see the world from the company's point of view. We start to absorb the values and perspective of the companies that we're working with. This is very important and, and, and very powerful. But there's a weakness embedded in it, which is that we lose the capacity to understand our business from the customer's point of view, from their perspective to have empathy for what it's like for someone who doesn't have our knowledge and our perspective to use our products and services. It's just it happens no matter who you are and no matter which company you're in. In fact, you start to develop a kind of confirmation bias, right? So you guys are familiar with this term and you know the whole field of behavioral economics. I talk a lot about it in my book because it had a big impact on me. And it really helped me understand what I'm talking about right now. So uh, in 1999, um, well, in 1998, we had worked for Travelocity and created the first Fast Fair Finder. Big hit. Then the head of product development, a guy named Chuck Geiger, moved from Travelocity to Gateway. And he called us and said, would you, would you come help us out here? Uh, we're not doing as well with our e-commerce. And uh, we want to be more like Dell. OK. Gateway at the time had a great case of Dell envy. Envy is like arrogance. It blinds you, right? So I said to Chuck, I said, you know, if we find out from the data analysis and spending some time with your customers that you need to be more like Dell, we'll certainly say that. But if we find something else out, well, you know, we'll tell you that too. We're not going to tell you what you want to hear, as you know. He said, great, fine. And then I had this brainstorm. It was lucky. I can't, I can't tell you that it was, you know, something that I had thought about for years and understood. I just, I don't know, I ate something good for breakfast that day, right? I said to Chuck, would you please invite some of the other leaders from Gateway to come out with us to observe Gateway potential customers and current customers researching and shopping for a computer online. And he said, OK, thank God, because it ended up being the most important thing that I learned. So we brought people, let's say Emily here, who was shopping for a computer, thinking about buying a Gateway, and was thinking about buying it online. OK. You had to, of course, understand in 1999, many people weren't necessarily buying online. And we brought them in, and, uh, and we said, Emily, you're in the market to buy a computer. We understand. Great. And you're thinking, OK, cool. Just, would you just shop and research? We're not going to say much. Don't mind us. Just think out loud. It's not a usability test. We're not going to task you. It's not a focus group. We're not interested in your opinions. We're going to watch. So Emily tools around. And sad for Emily, and by the way, I say this in all my talks. Google wasn't up yet, <laughs> OK? So she's struggling with bad search results at Alta Vista and Lycos and Excite and Yahoo and whatever. And she finally makes it to Gateway. And the Gateway homepage is a train wreck, right? And she gets completely frustrated. And with the leaders behind the glass, she types in, on her own, without any prompting from us, Dell.com. And you can imagine what they, <laughs> and she's not our customer. <laughs> I said, all right. She struggles over at Dell. We bring her back to Gateway. We say, well, let's just go back there. We get her into the process. Now, we learned some important things at that moment important to, to Gateway. The most important thing we learned is that the paradigm that Gateway and Dell had created in the 1980s, the way that they sold computers, which was you tell us what you want, 
you know, you can figure it, we'll build it and send it to you, was not working anymore for the Emilys of the world. Emily didn't want to configure her computer. She didn't know what RAM was. She just wanted the whole thing. She didn't know how to get it, but she was very frustrated. And here's the remarkable thing. By the end of two days, OK, just two days, of watching Emily and Emily 1, 2, 3, 4, up to Emily 16, and we saw the similar pattern without you know, tasking or setting the context. By the end of those two days, not only had we learned something important that helped foot and explain the data that we had analyzed, but more importantly than that, the leaders of Gateway themselves had changed their minds. They had actually gone through their own confirmation bias, which is notoriously difficult to change, and come out on the other side. They had developed some empathy and compassion and understanding for Emily's perspective on Gateway and how to buy a computer, not their own. And that just blew my mind, like holy moly. Confirmation bias, first of all, you don't know when you have it. You don't know when it's operating, OK? If you read all the way to the end of Daniel Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, has anyone attempted that, by the way? So I know. It's actually it's a, little, a little hard to read, but it's worth it. So he's the co-founder of behavioral economics, wins the Nobel Prize, blah, 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 40 years of research, proving that we don't know what we're doing most of the time. And at the end of the book, he says, despite all of this, me being a co-founder, that is, winning the Nobel Prize, discovering confirmation bias recency, or co-discovering, or doing research around it, whatever the case may be. I myself, Daniel Kahneman, have no idea when I'm doing all of these things. What? The world expert, the one who co-founded the field, he himself has no idea? What are we supposed to do about all this? You know, so we have the knowledge, but the knowledge doesn't change our behavior. Okay. Well. It helped clarify for me. He then says this, though. He says, if you're in a social context, if you see and connect with other people, it starts to expose for you some of these biases in yourself and in others. I thought, oh, that's what we learned in 1999. And that's why every project after that, the 400 projects we did, whether we're working with Facebook, helping them figure out our uh, non-college students interested in Facebook, <laughs> Right, early days of Facebook. Uh, you know, now, now they're trying to figure out if college students are interested. But, hey, they've got a 1.3 billion users, so what the hell, right? Um, whether it's that or, or working with a company like American Express or whatever the case may be, I set a rule. Anyone who has a say on this product or service, and by the way, veto power over what the team comes up with in terms of a new product, a service, or experience, has to come out and directly observe some of this research themselves. It's the only way that we will shift their perspective. It doesn't matter how good our data analysis is. If they already have a sacred assumption about the way they're working, they won't see the full implications. We need this. And it's such a simple thing. Notice I'm not trying to create a complicated framework with a cool piece of jargon around it and maybe some copyright and you have to license this for me to do it. No, I'm simply saying get out from behind your desk. And make a habit of it. And obviously, you can't do it all the time. And different people have different roles. But don't let it be a group over here that does it and reports back to you. And you yourself have never done it. Steve Jobs did it. Sam Walton did it. I have a whole case study in the book about Walmart that I think you'll find very, very interesting. And a colossal mistake they later made because they got more focused on themselves and their envy of that French retailer, Target, than on their ordinary customers. And they lost context and the ability to see. And they didn't go into the stores as much as they once did. Warren Buffett, by the way, does this, little known fact. Like, uh, Warren Buffett, he's a customer experience leader, a pioneer. What, that guy in Omaha? Yes, actually, that guy. When he made a, an all-important investment in American Express in the early 60s, he actually went out and watched people using their American Express cards. It wasn't the only thing he did. He did, you know, the guy's a wizard. He did all kinds of analysis, but he did that too, OK? Some of the best companies do this. And it's the m simple message that I have. At the end of the day, we'll start with, we'll end with where we started. We're dealing with real people, real human beings, employees, customers, real living human beings. And it turns out we human beings are, despite what we think, more similar to each other than we are different in a vast variety of ways. The only way we can remember 
what it's like to be a customer of our company is to get out and spend some time with them. Not in a focus group where we're giving them some artificial construct or a usability test and there's value uh, for those, but direct observations of people searching or people using email, right? And I know you do this, and you do this to some extent, but all of you need to do this, and you need to make a regular habit of it. And I, what I find is that companies, even those that know it, forget it sometimes. And that, in fact, is the most important thing that I learned and the simplest, simplest recommendation I have for you. So thank you so much for having me here. Really a pleasure. And uh, why don't we conclude, and if there are any comments or questions, uh, we can end with that. You shared the Steve Jobs video, and yeah. you yourself said that the customer is the focus, and we start with the customer and go back to the technology. Yeah. But as an engineer, if I have some this awesome, cool technology, yes. which is awesome for me, yes. but it's just a technology, it's not a product yet. That's right. Yeah. So like, what is your advice for me to go and find the right customers for yeah. such a scenario? Well, see, you know, it's great. And, you know, obviously engineers are the backbone of Silicon Valley, right? But my message to you is get out and spend some time with your end users, right? And, and there's a lot of reasons. There's time. People are busy. You know, uh, there's a lot of things we can talk about. It's awkward. Frankly, one of the, it's emotionally hard to spend time with customers. It really, because they trample all over the things you care about without knowing it, right? And then, oh my, you know, this thing you thought was so important, they don't give a damn about, right? Yeah. <laughs> but I would say to you, do some unstructured observations, not even about the technology necessarily that you're working on, although maybe in that sphere, just to try to understand where are some pain points and obstacles and let that guide. You know, you have great, I'm, I'm going to assume, you know, we don't know each other, but I'm, you know, if you're an engineer here at Google, you've got some great skill, talent. Maybe you have some real insights about some technology. That's really valuable. What you may not have as much of is a real empathetic understanding of your customer. Yeah. So. Uh, but the, the, the way you suggest, uh, yeah. so if I start looking at the customers, yeah. what problems they face, and try to draw back to the technology, yeah. then I might find the technology I started with wouldn't like fit that particular That's right. case, right? That's right. Because maybe there's this ancillary technology or this, this quarter inch turn you can make that, wow, I didn't even think about that. Because you can't, because you're inside the company. It's by nature. You cannot see uh, the customer the way the customers see you and what their needs are. No matter how smart you are. One of the bottom lines of my book, knowledge is not enough. It's frustrating, especially for those of us who, you know, have built our careers on it. It's important, but it's not enough. We also need empathy. We need the heart and the head. Around, like, in larger companies, how do you build kind of the excitement about customer experience and really yeah. staying customer focused? I know yeah. like, there's... There's a know. lot of complexity, yeah. right? Absolutely. And I don't want to pretend that's not true. Um, but, you, you, you know, what I always say, I was a community organizer before I got into business. Maybe you pick that up a little bit and sort of how I am, right? Um, I, I really, I do, I care about people and, and I care about communities. Um, and what you learn as a community organizer, if you want to change things in the world, uh, is that it's brick by brick. It's slow. And many people complain to me, oh, you know, I can't get the culture here to change. And my answer to them is you've got the wrong time horizon. Okay, if you're hoping to have an impact on the culture and the degree of momentum, excitement, etc., that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. Most people quit before it really happens. You know, so we all know a little bit about the civil rights movement, right? And we know about Martin Luther King's speech in 1963. But do you know how many decades people were working to create the possibility for the civil rights movement to emerge? When was the NAACP founded? Does anyone know? If you had to guess, you're, you're in the neighborhood. It was the beginning of just the beginning of the 20th century, right? And of course, there were abolitionists and others. You know, I mean, this is, and in fact, if you want to really understand a time horizon, we're just now in the West beginning to have a society where women are more equal, right? Treat, they were always equal fundamentally, but not treated as such. 2,500 years ago, Plato in the Republic calls for the complete equality of women in every aspect of life. Military, 
you know, political, you know, business, the whole kit and caboodle. And it took us 2,500 years to get to the point where we're starting to act on that. These are long time horizons. Now, I'm not suggesting it's going to take 2,500 years. <laughs> but it's going to be more than a week and then more than a month and more likely more than a year, right? But you can start small, start somewhere. Where, where is there an opening? Where is there an engineer who wants to get out a little bit from the box and do something a little different? Work with that person. You know, see if you can develop some success around that. And then keep going. Um, and uh, get in touch with me if, 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 if you ever want some sounding board advice or what have you. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Cool. I know there are people on Hangout, and I don't yeah. know if they're able to ask no, questions. Not or, really, but they'll, uh, yeah. they'll follow up. Later. They'll follow up. Yeah. My email address is pterry at collaborativegain.com. And if that's too long, it's pterry at gmail.com. <laughs> By the way, I'll tell you, uh, uh, this, uh, since I'm at Google, I'll just end with this. So I, you know, I was one of the earliest uh, Gmail users because of uh, Marissa and Bradley and others here. And I, I'm so happy to get that email address, right? Every single day, I'm not talking about spam. Every single day, I get email from people all over the world who think I'm someone else. Because my email address is so simple. I'm Pam Terry, Patricia Terry in England and you know, all over the world. I get you know, bank account signups. People sign, and then you know, here's your bank. I'm like, oh, shit. You know, and I'm like <laughs> calling the bank. This is not me, and you don't want this information. I, so I have actually a folder in my Gmail account called Other Fills, <laughs> where I have years of these. I might actually write a book about, you know. You can take it away. What's that? You can take it away. If that's, uh... Oh, no, but I love my email address. I love my email address. My only, I, my only disappointment is I didn't do fill at Gmail, although I think actually that was taken at that point. But anyway, so thank you so much. Uh, please take a look at the book. Let me know what you think, and, and, and stay in touch. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.